Yes. We have a very, very special treat. Many of you might have seen the next gentleman on stage. The New York Times said he was so similar when he was in a play with the wonderful actor whom we all love and respect, Al Pacino, and that he was a continuation of that spirit and that expertise and that genius of being able to be whatever it was at the moment where it wasn't acting, it was more like alchemy. That's what all the Stanislavski stuff was about when I worked with Ilya Kazan, when he directed in the theater. When we were doing after the fall, someone said, well, Mr. Kazan, you want me to move over from this side of the stage to that side with my training at the actor's studio? I have to need a motivation. Why is it that I'm doing that? And Kazan said, because I told you to. <laughs> and he explained to me over and over again that that whole idea was just to be for real that it wasn't acting, it was just being. And that's true with anything and everything. It's especially true when you watch TV and see some of the, the politicians. It's incredible as a crash course in bad acting. <laughs> and when they make the reality TV people look like Lars Olivier, then you know that we, they should all go to, if not acting school, reality school. So this is a, is a wonderful artist who reads Jack Kerouac so beautifully that when Carolyn Cassidy, who is the widow of Neil Cassidy, who was the hero of On the Road, heard John Vendemilia the first time, she said, it's just like Jack's in the room. And Joyce Johnson, a great, great National Book Award winning author, who was responsible for Jack's Visions of Cody finally being published and a great champion of his, and also wrote a great book of her own called Minor Characters, and another one um, called The uh, Door Wide Open, The Letters Between Her and Jack, and many, many books of her own um, had a great play based on that. And for two years, off and on, we did it here at the Bowery Poetry Club at different places around New York. And I knew all the people in the play because they were real people. And my daughter, a dear of my second daughter, actually played the 22-year-old Joyce Johnson. And even with all that, every single night that I was there, I got so much into what John was doing, I forgot that it was a play or that it was anything that I had anything to do with. It just became the reality. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing and a wonderful gift. And John's so gracious after his great success in The Sopranos, Instead of going off to Hollywood and getting 18 bodyguards and, and going into real estate development, giving up acting, he's still doing more and more than ever. He's recorded the entire scroll version of On the Road for a Viking. And probably in the next 40 or 50 years, they'll figure that maybe they should put it out. And whatever they do, it'll sound just as good because what he does is for keeps. He's been a great friend and a great ambassador for Jack Kerouac to younger people to see the artistic, beautiful side of Jack's writing. And you don't have to scream, holler, shout, phone with the mouth, and have a band not listening, blow everybody out of the room in order to make it jazz, poetry, beat stuff. You do what I'm saying, man. But rather, just what Jack, like every great writer before him, tried to do, which was to create a moment in time. So please welcome the effervescent John Ventimiglia, reading Jack Ruff. but you don't know the words. I'm just hoping I didn't lose that matchbook marker. I think I got it right here. <clears throat> this is something we've never done before, but what the hell, let's just do it. <clears throat> let's see, it's turned so many years. Yeah. <clears throat> Cody's going home. He's going home. And here are some of the letters prepared under the moon and mailed and loved through these immensities and impossibilities of the land of his birth 
Dear Cody, no, it makes no difference now. Lester Young's chorus of You Can Count On Me, 1938, yes. Lester used to blow like a son of a bitch. And it's time to say, well, it's time to say so. It was in Chicago. We saw the children of the modern jazz night blowing their horns and instruments with belief. And it was Lester that started it all. The gloomy, sanely serious goof who was behind the history of modern jazz. And this generation, like Louis his, Bird his, Chevalier, in a stage door poster, his drape, his drooping melancholy disposition in the sidewalk, in the door, his pork pie hat, at sessions all over the country from Kansas City to the Apple and back to LA, they used to call him pork pie because he'd wear that gone hat and blow in it. What door standing influence has Cody gained from this cultural master of his generation? What mysteries as well as masteries? What styles, sorrows, collars, the removal of collars, the removal of lapels, the crepe sole shoes, the beauty goof? One night I saw Lester in a reverie on the stand make such faces in his thoughts as the audience of watchers that that sneer, that twitch, that Billy Holiday had it too that compassion for the dead those poor little musicians in Chicago, their love of Lester early heroisms in a room records of Lester, early count, suits hanging in the closet tanned evenings in ballrooms the great tennis solo in the shoe shine jukebox. You could hear Lester blow from LA to Boston, Frisco to New York, Seattle to Philly, Kansas City, Kansas to Kansas City, Missouri, 1935-40. Lester has a hold of his generation. In New York's swank apartment, Lionel droops by a 20-story French window with a listen to Lester clarinet early solo on way down yonder in New Orleans, the other side. He sunk down to here. An Englishman discovering the greatness of America and a single Negro musician. Lester's just like the river. The river starts, starts in near Butte. Montana and frozen snow caps. Three forks, and the Amazon down across states and entire territorial areas of Dunbleak land, with Hawthorne crackling in the silent. Picks up rivers at Bismarck, Omaha, and St. Louis just north. Another at Cairo, another in Arkansas, Tennessee. Comes deluging on New Orleans with muddy news from the land and a roar of subterranean excitement that is like the vibrations of the entire land. Sucked of its gut in mad midnight, fevered hot. The big mud hole, rank claw pole, old frogular pod, soul titanic Mississippi. From the north, full of wires, cold wood, and horns. night with aged cyclists and young railroad Tom Sawyers with their sh shroud hats on their back heads, drinking brews across the street at lunch hour, one, two, three blocks from the little Harlem of old madness and imaginary useless reveries, <clears throat> the height of elephant, a cock, a goat's eye, dark laughter has come again. I've pressed up girls in Asheville saloons. Dance with them in roadhouses where mad heroes stomp one another to death in tragic driveways by the moon. 
I've laid whores. I've laid whores on a strip of grass along the cornfield outside of Durham, North Carolina, and applied bay rum in the highway lights. I've thrown empty whiskey bottles clear over the trees in Maryland copsies on soft nights when Roosevelt was president. I've knocked down fifth and trans state chucks as the Y.O. road unreal. I've jammed home shots of whiskey on 6th Avenue and Frisco and the Londons of Prime in Florida and L.A. I made soup my chaser for 47 states. I've passed off the back of cabooses, Mexican buses and bowls of ships in Midwestern tempests. I've laid women on coal piles in the snow, on fences and beds and up against suburban garage walls from Massachusetts to the tip of San Joaquin. Cody, me no Cody. Cody's about America. I drunk with his brother in a thousand bars. I've had hangovers with old sewing machine whores that were twice his mother's 12 years ago and his heart was dewy. I learned how to smoke cigars in bad houses and hot box cars in no audience. I've driven on Sunday afternoons across the lemon fields with Indians and their sisters, and I sat at the inaugurations of Tennessee, me no Tennessee, Memphis, ain't me no Montana, Three Forks. I'll still suck me in North Atlantic territory in the free, that's how I feel. I've heard guitars tinkling sadly across hillbilly hollows in the mist of great smokies of night long ago. Man of the broad, mysterious, smoky night. That's what he said, man. When Pa Gant returned from California, I stood outside musical doorways and a thousand misty heroisms across the big sad land. Well, I'm writing this book because we're all gonna die. In the loneliness of my life, my father dead, my brother dead, my mother far away, my sister and my wife far away. Nothing here but my own tragic hands that were once guarded by a world of sweet attention that now are left to guide themselves and disappear their own way into the common dark of all our deaths. Sleeping in my raw bed, alone and stupid with just this one pride and consolation. My heart broke in the general despair and opened inward to the Lord. I made a supplication in this dream. Last time I saw him, it was on a sad and strange circumstances. Remy Bonsure had arrived in New York after having gone around the world several times in ships. I wanted him to meet and know Dean. And they did meet. But Dean couldn't talk anymore and said nothing, and Remy turned away. Remy had gotten tickets for the Duke Ellington concert at the Metropolitan Opera and insisted that I come with him and his girl. Remy was fat and sad now, but still the eager and formal gentleman. And he wanted to do things the right way, as he emphasized. So he got his bookie to drive us to the concert in Cadillac. It was a cold winter's night. And the Cadillac was parked and ready to go. And Dean stood outside the window with his bag ready to go to Penn Station and on across the land. Goodbye, Dean, I said. I sure wish I didn't have to go to the concert. And 
Do you think you could, uh, <clears throat> you think I could ride with you at 40th Street with you? you know? I want to be with, with you as much as possible. I want to be with you as much as possible, my boy. And besides, it's so darn cold in this here New York. Now I whispered to Remy, now he wouldn't have it. He liked me, but he didn't like my idiot friends. I wasn't going to start all over again ruining his planned evenings he had done at Alfred's in San Francisco in 1957 with Roland Major. Absolutely out of the question, Sal. Poor Remy. He had a special next tie made for the evening, and on it was painted a, a replica of the concert tickets and the names Sal and Laura and Remy and Vicky, the girl together with a series of sad jokes and some of his favorite sayings, such as, you can't teach an old maestro new tricks. So, so Dean, he couldn't ride with us uptown, and the only thing I could do was sit in the back of the Cadillac and wave at him. The bookie at the wheel also wanted nothing to do with Dean. Dean. Ragged. And a moth eaten overcoat he bought, especially for the freezing temperatures of the east, walked off alone. And the last I saw of him, he rounded the corner of 7th Avenue, eyes on the street ahead, and bent to it again. And poor little Laura, my baby, to whom I've told everything about Dean, began almost to cry. Oh, we shouldn't let him go on like this. What will happen to Dean, she said. Old Dean's gone, I thought. And out loud, I said, he'll be all right. And off we went to the sad and disinclined concert for which I had no stomach, whatever. And all the time I was thinking of Dean and how he got back on the train and rode over 3,000 miles over that awful land and never knew why he had come anyway except to see me. So, in America when the sun goes down and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over the west coast and all that road going and all the people dreaming and the immensity of it and in Iowa I know by now the children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry Tonight the stars will be out. And don't you know the god is Pooh Bear? The evening star must be drooping and shedding a sparkle of dims on the prairie, which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. And nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. I think of Dean Moriarty. I even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. I think of Dean Moriarty. I think of Dean Moriarty. John Ventimiglia. Reading the works of Jack Kerouac. We used to walk all up and down this very block.
quite a while ago, and his words and spirit are still here right now in 2011. Because the thing of beauty is a joy forever. Thank heavens. We have a wonderful